Would you like to know some fascinating facts about water? And you won't want to miss this. I'm talking with renowned climatologist and hydrologist Peter Glick, author of a new book, The Three Ages of Water. Water, to paraphrase Dr. Glick, is special. It's a basic natural resource that we depend on as much as our ancestors did. But it's also part of our biology, evolutionary history, shaping human civilizations, religions, and art and cultures while nurturing the environment. Water made us long before we tried to control and manage. I'm your host, Charlie Wilson, and welcome to What Matters Water TV and Podcast. We want to thank you for joining us today. Now, let's get after it with Dr. Glick. Well, Dr. Peter Glick is an internationally recognized environmental scientist and communicator and co-founder of the Pacific Institute in Oakland, California. His work addresses the critical connections between water, energy, food, and health, the impacts of climate change, and international security and conflicts over water resources. He's won some very impressive accolades for his work, including a MacArthur Foundation Genius Fellow. So with that, I want to formally welcome Dr. Peter Glick. Thank you for being with us on What Matters Water TV and Podcast. Um, Peter, I got to start with, you know, what the heck is a Genius Fellow? <laughs> So, so, Charlie, I'm very happy to be here. Thank, thank you for having me on. Uh, you know, that's not a name that I think the MacArthur Foundation gives to it. It's just sort of a, it's just gotten that reputation. And I don't know what a genius is. Uh, so. <laughs> Somebody somewhere thought you had done something of note. So MacArthur Foundation doesn't mess around. So congratulations on that well, among your you. many accolades. So I, I guess we do on a serious note, we sort of have to start today because really the, the crux of our conversation, you have a new book. And yes. uh, it is, uh, it's coming out here in June, The Three Ages of Water. Um, and I, as we sort of described as sort of an, an, an epic tome linking sort of the history of water with the world. Talk for me a little bit about your process behind what is, I mean, it was really well documented and a very ambitious book that you took on. What was its genesis and, and really how did something like that, how long does it take you to write a piece like that? <laughs> so in some ways, it's taken me my whole life to write this book. Um, I've been working on water for a long time, on all different aspects of water, uh, which is a wonderful topic, as I'm, I'm sure we'll get into in detail. Uh, I'm trained as a scientist, but my work has been sort of the intersection of science and society, science and policy. And it just has developed over really my career that the importance of water for all of human history is something that that has fascinated me and that's really what this book is it's a it's a it's the human history written in water uh it looks at water from really from frank, frankly from the foundation of the solar system <laughs> up was, to the present and and up to the future yeah i was i was going to say literally from the beginning of time <laughs> yeah <laughs> there was, that's kind of i was surprised just in the opening it's like Oh, no, he's really going to go there. I did, you know, I mean, sort of curious, where did water come from? And and you sort of have to go way, way back in time in order to answer that question. So it so, was actually fun to do the research on that all by itself. <laughs> so so I, because I then I got to ask in the follow up is, is you've got, I mean, if you're going to go back that far, really, where did water come from? And because we sort of talk about this, you know, is there life on other planets kind of thing? And then there's that mystery of, well, how did we end up as this sort of very unique place in the universe? How does that kind of formation, how does that really then inform sort of the, as you say, the policy stuff? I'm skipping way forward and we're going to come back. But how does that kind of beginning inform sort of today's policy descriptions or, or, or debates? Well, you know, sort of separately from today's policy debates, I, I thought it was important for me to understand this, you know, writers write for a lot of re reasons. I wrote this book because I wanted to write it. I, whether anybody reads it or not, I don't, I don't know. But it was interesting to me in part because really at the sort of most cosmic level, we are the only place that we know life exists. So I'm, you know, logically convinced that there's life everywhere around the universe, that there's tons of it. Without a doubt, the only forms of life that we know and understand have a basis in water. So right at the beginning, the fact that that we exist is attributed in part to the fact that there happened to be water here and there happened to be ultimately the conditions conducive to what became became life. And so I was interested 
how did how did water start? Where, how did the solar system get water? How did Earth get water? How did water play a role in the creation of life and the evolution of Homo sapiens? And all of that led up to now we deal with water as humans. How do we deal with it? What does it mean to us? How do we treat it? What does it mean for society? What does it mean both in today, thinking about today and thinking about tomorrow? But that that beginning sense of, of where water came from, I was just really curious. And that's sort of why it's in the book. Well, I find it interesting because those of us that sort of wear our water backpacks and are engaged in this daily conversation about water, water policy and how it should be managed, it's sort of a trite saying, it's like, you know, water is life. But as you point out, really in the foundation of the book, yeah, <laughs> absent water, there is none of us. We're very unique in that way. And so that's kind of the rallying cry in a very real sense as to who we are, or what we're about, that absent that one set of molecules, you know, we're we're really just like the dust in everywhere else in the universe. That, that's right. Water, water is life as we know it. And uh in part because of that, I think, you know, those of us who work in water maybe take this for granted, but I think everybody really cares about water. When you come right down to it, water's connected to everything we care about. It's connected to food. It's connected to ecosystem health and human health and and production of goods and services and, and sort of everything. Uh, that's partly why I've been interested in water from the beginning. Um, and writing about the early history was not only fun for me, but it also led up to the more detailed discussions later in the book about what what it means for society and what it means for us today. All right. Well, so as long as I'm still playing with the theme of in the beginning, so you've been at this a very long time and yeah. uh, you've done a lot of work. But I have to ask then the question as a young man, was it, hey, I'm just going to grow up and be a water scientist? How did you actually get to this place where getting into science, getting into water science, Ah, you know, most young people I know, they want to grow up to be a, you know, a movie star or a ball player or something. Did you always want to be a, a scientist and you want to be in and around the issues of water? Um, I, I guess, you know, uh, <laughs> for, from the early, from my early days, I want, I was interested in the environment. Uh, you know, I grew up in the, in the sixties, uh, when environmental issues were starting to become important. We started to think about air pollution and water pollution. Um, you know, I grew up in a big city. I grew up in New York. Uh, air pollution was an issue then. Uh, so I, I I was a bird watcher early on. You know, I was interested in getting out into nature. But I didn't really get into the issue of water until really graduate school. I, I, I got my undergraduate degree. I went to graduate school in energy and resource issues. I learned a lot about energy and environmental issues. And gravitated ultimately to water. My master's work was on uh, the environmental impacts of hydroelectric systems. My doctorate was really on climate change and water. It was really one of the first uh, first efforts to try and understand what climate change would mean for water resources in the, you know, in the mid 80s. And it was sort of be before climate was, was, was really a big issue. And that led ultimately to, to water. The importance of water is connected to all of those things. And uh, and I guess sort of it was a progression. Well, and obviously then through that, you've, you've worked as an in, in environmental science for, for a lot of years. And this field is clearly, it comes through in your writing, something you're very personally passionate about. So I'm, I'm curious, um, from the book standpoint, you, you sort of said you're not really, you don't really care who buys it, although you wouldn't have written it if you didn't want people to read something and get something out of it. I'm, I'm wondering, who do you hope does read this book who would value it most you think uh, or would get the most out of it if they read your book and and are there minds and hearts that you're looking to change or hoping to change as a result of it so uh, i you know i said writers write for themselves um obviously anybody who writes a book hopes somebody will buy it <laughs> somebody will read it <laughs> in this case um it's different than my science writings and my journal articles than the research reports that I've done for many, many years. Uh, this book is really written for the general public. It's written for anybody interested in history. It's written for anybody interested in water. It's written for anybody interested in the water crises we face. Uh, it's written for anybody who is worried about our future, but wants to hear a positive story. Again, as I'm sure we'll 
we'll come back to, um, I'm an optimist deep down. I really believe that we can solve our problems, our water problems, and more broadly, our environmental problems. I don't know that we will, but I believe that we can. Uh, and so I wrote this book in part also to tell a positive story about the innovative things that are happening worldwide around water, the smart things that are happening, the solutions that people are trying in different places with the idea of saying, we could have a positive, sustainable future. And, and so I, you know, I think there's a lot of doom and gloom out there. And in part, I hope that one of the audiences for this book will be people who want to hear maybe a way out of that doom and gloom. Right. So, and I guess that's one of the, the kind of the things that, because we deal with that a lot here with the water, Southern California Water Coalition. It's trying to find ways to, as we like to say, educate to advocate, you know, capital E education, small A advocacy, that if people have the information that they need to make an informed choice, they'll advocate in their own self interest, right? They will be mobilized to engage in the public process. It's all too often, I think we find that, you know, oh, just let those guys, the people in the Capitol, let the legislators, they'll figure it out. We just need to put pressure on them. They need to come up with the answers. But it's really a reversal of that. It's kind of coming from that grassroots up that you really kind of need to have the general public understand what the issues are so they can help people make that informed choice. Is it not? Yes. You know that, Charlie, that's a really great point. And I, I make this point in the book, too, that. uh we have two paths before us. We could we could follow that sort of dystopian end of the world doom and gloom path uh, where our problems continue to get worse, or we can choose an alternative path. And I, and I I make the point that it that uh, we have that choice. That's one of the things people don't really understand. We do have that choice, and that if we make the right choices. We can choose a not the doom and gloom path. We can choose a path to a more sustainable future. We can choose to look at what works. We can choose to look at successes. We can look choose to look at the innovative people and and communities out there that are solving these water problems. And we can choose that different path. And that if we fail, it's not because we couldn't reach that positive future. It's because we didn't. Well, and I think this is part of what your book does. It really is a, a, a chronology of, as you said, sort of the formation of you know water here on Earth. But it's really about that that evolution through human history and both the good that came from humans' interaction with water, the, the very bad things that came from humans in their interaction with water, and sort of what we've been able to technologically create systems to manage, sort of all very positive. And then those all come with counterbalancing challenges and and problems so we're never really solving per se we're also are we just evolving continually and we still have sort of new chapters to come to or do you see us as really kind of coming up against this sort of a hard and fast if we don't solve the current day situation then we're going to have really dramatic um changes to essentially human existence on the planet well, I don't mean to get too de depressing here, but but I do believe <laughs> I do believe we're at a we're at a crossroads right now. Um, we're at a time when there are serious global challenges. Water is a big part of that, but climate change is a big part of that, uh, and of course, water is a big part of climate change. But there are also social and cultural dynamics at work. Uh, there are issues around population growth and, and economics that sort of make the next, sort of make today, and I would argue the coming few decades, a time when we have to make a transition where things could, could get a lot worse, but things could get a lot better. And understanding that we're at that crossroads and understanding that we do have those choices that we've talked a little bit about, um, I think is really important. And this this book is partly a past history. You know, the subtitle of the book is prehistoric, uh, what is it? <laughs> I have to remember. Prehistoric <laughs> past, imperiled present, and a hope for the future. And so it talks about, those are the three ages. It talks about the past and the role that water played in our prehistoric history. It talks about the modern times, the second age of water, which I would argue is really our age, which was a, an age of scientific and artistic revolutions and advances and technological improvements. And as you noted, unintended consequences. 
and the hope for the future, the positive possibilities that, that are in front of us. So in the research for the book, then, were there any set of statistics or facts or things that conclusions that you came to that that for you, having been in this for a very long time, were sort of aha moments, things you hadn't really thought about or come to that conclusion yet that you really brought you to a new place today? Well, there were all sorts of wonderful stories in the book that I really had a lot of fun digging into. I mean, the origin of water in the universe, the origin of water in the solar system. You know, I, I sort of read that literature, but but I really had to dig into that. Um, the role that water and climate played in the evolution of Homo sapiens and the migration of humanity out of Africa and across the world was new to me, that story. Uh, the role that climatic conditions and, and hydrologic conditions played in, in both... Uh, I guess helping Homo sapiens become the dominant species, and then how and when we left our ancestral home and and populated the planet. That that was news. That was sort of information, new information to me. It, it is, um, but but for a very dry period, we weren't really able to get around that far, were we? <laughs> we we weren't, and then you know the climate and, and there, changed, and, and there was no green. need no things, need to get around. And things got green, and it offered new avenues for migration and. Anyway, there's lots of interesting background there that, that was new new to me. Um, you know, some of the history of the early chemistry and physical understandings of water and, and how we discovered oxygen and hydrogen and carbon dioxide <laughs> and carbonated water was interesting. And, uh, you know, some of the, I've done a lot of work for a long time on conflicts over water, but, but uh, researching some of the examples and stories in the book was also int- interesting and fun. Well, I, I have to be candid, and I have to share with you as well that it sort of brought me back to my undergraduate days of all things, uh, back at UCLA, which we talked about a little bit before. Being a political scientist at the time, and that was, you know, when I graduated, it was the, you know, the era of salt and arms limitations, and everybody was focused on, you know, mutual assured destruction and how do we get out of this quagmire. And I recall just because one of my my uh, uh, classmates. His father worked down at Scripps. We ended up doing a very pretty significant political science uh, discussion about the uh, importance or what would happen if you were able to weaponize where you could grow food. Changing the regions of food production globally was far more powerful than any weapon anybody could ever design. And here we are now, 35, 40 years later, and it's about climate change. And what are we dealing with is the transformation of growing regions, who can grow food, where they grow food, and and, and the the, how that plays into literally international peace. Um, And then this global interdependence that we have. Uh, Those were the kinds of things I sort of like pulled back from long time ago. It's like, hey, wait, you know what, we were onto something back then. And we weren't we weren't so we were just naive, stupid little undergraduates at that point. No, that's right. You know, I spent a lot of time in exactly that field. Uh, so I wrote a paper a long time ago in the early 90s called Water in Conflict that looked at the issue of what we called at the time environmental security, the role that environment and resources play in international security. And at the time, and it really in the late 80s as well, the focus of the international security community was on what we called realpolitik, that is superpower politics, uh, the U.S. and the Soviet Union, nuclear weapons, conflict mm-hmm. in Eastern Europe, that kind of thing. And the traditional international security community, they didn't want to talk about environmental security issues. That was a separate kind of a thing. It wasn't really a field of international security. And I and others were making the argument that, look, resource issues, access to oil and energy, access conflicts over water resources, conflicts over food, could play and were beginning to play as important a role in international politics and tensions as traditional realpolitik. And at first, we were some of us were ridiculed, and there was a big fight in the academic community about this. But of course, reality tends to, to <laughs> teach academics what they're not sometimes will, willing to look at themselves. And in the food area, as again, you may remember, uh, Jimmy Carter imposed a food embargo on the Soviet Union right. when they invaded Afghanistan. And it was sort of the first 
one of the first efforts to use food as a weapon, and there was a lot of controversy over it. A lot of people said, this is a really bad precedent to set, which I, I would agree with. But it was an example of how the world was changing then. And now I would, I would argue it's pretty clear everybody understands the roles that environment can play in politics, that water can play in conflict. And we see it daily now. And that resources and energy have always, frankly, played in the relationships among among countries. Well, I don't think there's any greater uh, example than the Middle East, particularly when you're talking about both energy and, and water, right? Right. You know, when you start really digging in on Israeli, Syrian, you know, Middle East, you know, it is, and, and we sort of forget that here in California. We don't have those kinds of threats, right? We, we just like to have fights with ourselves because we like to have fights, it's important, but it's not the same kind of fight that they have in the Middle yeah, East. It's not. No, we have conflicts over water in California. We probably always will. But at the moment, they're not violent conflicts. <laughs> and um, one of the things we've done for a long time at the Pacific Institute in Oakland is we maintain something called the water conflict chronology. It's an open source online database of water conflicts going back more than 4,000 years. And in the book, I talk about the very first known water war. Uh, it's in the first age of water. It's a, a war between two city-states in ancient Mesopotamia, 2400 BC. And it was a conflict over access to water from the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, access to irrigation canals, access to water for food. And even today, and this is a later chapter in this book as well, the conflicts over water in the Middle East are still a serious problem. Conflicts over access to water, water used as a weapon, water systems, casualties of conflict, and attacks on civilian water infrastructure. It's a story that goes back in the Middle East to ancient times and up until the present. Some would say we're still yet to learn a lot from history. <laughs> and keep, still, still keep repeating it. So I know we sort of opened the discussion, and, I, and your book does suggest that we are, if we don't choose a different path, we are on a bit of a dystopian future you know, trajectory, unless we take certain actions to fix our water management issues. Describe for me a little bit some of the potential consequences you think that, that the book uh, raises. So the second age of water is, as I said earlier, is, is our age, uh, but it starts probably with the Enlightenment, uh, with the growth of science and technology and art, the understanding of what water is and the role of water and water-related diseases, or the understanding of the connections between water and agriculture, the Green Revolution, which in many ways was a revolution of irrigation technology as much as it was a revolution of anything else. So the advantages of the Second Age around water were really the things that permitted us to build the society and the culture that we have today. Without those advances, we couldn't do what we're doing today. We couldn't feed 8 billion people. We couldn't provide cities with safe drinking water. We couldn't be talking about solving and curing water-related diseases. And so the second age of water was a, a tremendous advance in our ability, human ability, to deal with water resources. But, and there's maybe always a but, it was also a time when there were a series of unintended consequences from those advances. Uh, the impoverishment and destruction of ecosystems because we didn't care about or we didn't know the consequences of taking water out of the environment, consequences that we now better understand. Uh, the challenges associated with water poverty and the failure to provide safe drinking water and sanitation for billions of people worldwide. You know, it's the 21st century and we still haven't provided safe water and sanitation to everyone even though that's not a, as I argue in the book, a technical problem, it's not an economic problem, but we have failed to do that. And the consequences of that are continued water-related diseases and uh, women and, and girls who have to spend their lives collecting water, often unsafe water, rather than going to school and contributing to, to economic development and economic growth. Uh, the challenge of climate change, which has and will continue to have and is going to have enormous impacts on water resources, a whole series of unintended consequences, the, the water crises that we think about when we talk about water crises. And that's that's the downside of the second age of water. And that's the 
the the risk that we face if we don't address them is that those problems will get worse. So we can't live by the old George Carlin routine that, uh, you know, he never got very sick because he grew up in New York swimming in the East River. And if he could survive that, he could survive most anything. So, so that's <laughs> funny that you should bring that up. I, I have a very close friend who grew up in Pittsburgh and uh, he used to get, he and his friends, you know, they'd, they'd go out and they'd play and they'd get tremendous rashes of poison ivy. And he swears to me to this day that the way they would cure their poison ivy was to swim in the hugely contaminated river that flows through Pittsburgh. And it would, the acids and the chemicals would, would cure them of poison ivy. I, so maybe George Carlin was onto something. I, I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, see, again, we take very serious subjects. I told you, Peter, we, we've got to have some fun with them once in a while. Otherwise, we just cry. So uh, absolutely. But <laughs> although I have to say, I grew up in New York City. And New York City has just a fantastic water supply. And I don't, this is, this is actually a story that I don't tell much in the book, but the history of New York City's water supply is a, a remarkable example of the ability to, for, a, for a, a city that has insight and foresight about their water needs, to build a water system to provide water for millions of people that to this day is a remarkably great water system. Well, and I'm reminded the same thing. I had spent some time in Holland and we were back there a couple of years ago and we were in the canals in Amsterdam around New Year's Eve. And you don't think of canal systems to be very clean. And I was educated that night by my, you know, the gentleman who was showing us through the city that they had undertaken a very serious cleanup effort in Amsterdam and that the, the canals actually were of drinking, just shy of drinking water quality. He was very proud of that fact that they had absolutely cleaned everything up. They had purified it and that they were on the right track. And, you know, the Dutch, I think of, you know, water issues. Those guys know a few things about water management. Kind of okay, but, you, know, you know, that's a great story because it, it's it's an example of the success stories that we should be all more aware of. Right. The fact that we can clean up our water systems. And, you know, again, I grew up in the I grew up in the 60s and the Cuyahoga River caught fire. It was a it was an <laughs> iconic iconic <laughs> event. Again, I talk about it in the book, but we've we've cleaned up in part because of the aware the growing awareness of those disasters led to the Clean Water Act. It led to the Safe Drinking Water Act in this country. It led to cleaning up Lake Erie. Now Lake Erie still has enormous challenges, but it's a lot cleaner than it used to be. And for those of us who who lived through those some of those times, the good news is we can see some of those hugely contaminated rivers and water bodies that today are cleaner than they used to be, and not as clean as they ought to be, and not as clean as they could be, but cleaner than they used to be. And it's an mm -hmm. example of the way that nature can be restored if we're willing to change our policies and to, to put in place the policies that that we ought to put in place for the future. Well, one of the pieces I did take out of the book is that you advocate that economists should be doing cost benefit analysis that include the loss of free flowing rivers, dislocated communities, floods, pollution, and, and the like. A explain a little bit about how this approach you think really could help better manage water resources. I mean, other than the examples of, yeah, we they're cleaner than you know we used to be, but sort of where do we take it? Um, yeah. And how does that all work? So I would argue that a lot of the fundamental flaws in the second age of water broadly are economic flaws. They're failures of our economic system to count and measure things properly. We're very, very good at calculating what taking a gallon of water out of a system and putting it to use for growing food or making semiconductors or, or making the goods and services we want or providing safe drinking water. We're very good at calculating the economic benefit of that. We're very bad at calculating the economic cost of the ecological destruction that our policies, whatever they are, our policies impose upon us. Uh, what's the economic value of driving a species to extinction? What's the economic value of drying up a river completely? What's the economic value 
or maybe I should be saying cost, of eliminating wetlands and destroying the Pacific Flyway uh, and wiping out salmon in the Sacramento and San Joaquin River. Uh, we're not very good at calculating those costs, but in the last few decades, there's been a trend toward trying to understand that side of economics. And there's a whole new field called ecological economics that's trying to put values on some of these things that we've never valued before. And what I argue is that if we were better at that, if we were better at, better at understanding not just the economic benefits of using water, but the economic costs of using water or the economic benefits of leaving water in place, our policies might be a little bit different. Uh, right. And I, I, again, I think we're starting to get a handle on some of that, but if we could do that better, that would go a long way toward giving us the right signals about what we want to do and ought to do. So let me ask, it kind of brings me to a place. I mean, clearly, I mean, by our discussion today and, and the book and the interaction I know you and I have had before, I mean, you're very passionate about sort of where we are in the environment and how we can make things better. And, and I asked this question because, and I actually asked this of, of uh, one of our friends a couple of years ago who at the time was an editor of the LA Times. So I'm just going to kind of rephrase the question a little bit. So as a scientist, when you were writing this book, you were discovering certain things. Is it the science that drives you to conclusion? And would that drive us to those economic benefits? Or is there a, a philosophical, the love for the environment, sort of a, I come to it with a viewpoint and then my science will help match that viewpoint to change the, the policy. Does that make sense in what I'm asking? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a scientist by training. Um, a, a scientist goes where the science leads us. Um, I believe very, very strongly that you can't have good policy without good science, and that policy ought to influence science, but that uh, that science ought to influence policy, that policy shouldn't influence science. Yeah. Um, if science led me somewhere else, I would have to go somewhere else. But I also believe that our values, that science isn't enough, that, that our values have to play a role in policy as well, um, that, that we have to decide what we want as a, as a community, as a, as a society, and that those values also have to have to play a role in influencing what and what we choose to do and how we choose to do it. You know, science can get us part of the way there, but you know, this, so so this is sort of relevant for the climate debate. Um, without a doubt, science tells us that humans are changing the climate. Without a doubt, science tells us that those changes are going to impose very very dramatic impacts on us including in particular on water resources, but not, not exclusively. But the question about how to deal with climate change, how to reduce emissions, should that be carbon taxes or should it be policy restrictions on fossil fuel production? Should it be, you know, they're, they're difficult policy questions. Those are, those science can help and economics maybe can help inform some of those but ultimately, those are difficult political questions that have to be decided. And a lot of the debate I get into with climate deniers, it turns out, except for the real extremists, <laughs> they're not really denying <laughs> they're not really denying the science. They're worried about what policies are going to be chosen to deal right. with the problem. Right. Maybe they're ideologically opposed to taxes. Uh, maybe they're ideologically opposed to government intervention. But those are policy questions, and they're difficult things for society to decide. So I am a scientist, but I also understand that science and policy together uh, have, have to interact in ways that that society has to agree upon. Right. Well, I think that's part of the background that I came with as well. I, and you pointed out in the book, technology's done some great things for us. And yes, it does have some of those unintended consequences, but I think because of where we are with AI and some of the things, some of the breakthroughs that are coming, I think technology actually probably does help, you know, solve some of these, these crises issues. And it's then whether you're doing new economics, you're doing various kinds of, of other validation. It's the, you know, there's no one-stop shop here. We're never yeah. done. I think that may be the message. We are never done. There is something we need to test, validate, and then what's the next step in how to get better. 
And there's also no single bullet, silver bullet solution. So let me go back to the technology question for a minute, because it's a really good example. Um, I said earlier that uh, the world has failed to meet basic human needs for water and sanitation for billions of people, unfortunately, even including some here in California. That's not a technology problem. We know how to produce the purest water from the dirtiest water. We know how to provide safe water and sanitation through water treatment systems and distribution systems. It's not a, that failure is not a technological failure. It's a failure of not putting the right money in the right place. It's a failure of governments who don't have the right levels of commitment, especially governments in developing countries who often have many other things to deal with. They're dealing with education and they're dealing with transportation. And they're dealing with health issues and they're dealing with communication and often they're dealing with corruption. Um, and so technology is a piece of this, but let's, let's apply the technology that we have and that we understand but let's also understand that sometimes it's getting the right money in the right place. It's getting the right leaders in the right place. It's getting the right levels of commitment and will in the right place. It's getting the right levels of community involvement. There is no silver bullet solution to water problems. Well, I think that's kind of where I like to come from because I'm, you know, the political scientist by nature and coalitions of people in the grassroots. But it's, you know, I think we use California as one of those great uh, microcosms. It's hard to say California is a microcosm, right? But when we're talking about glo global issues, you know, one of the things we talk about, you know, California is really big and really diverse. That's a really positive thing. Challenge? Yeah, California is really big and really diverse, which makes balancing out that equation quite difficult. Using California, using your friends there in Sacramento and trying to bring together coalitions of people with very different backgrounds, very different philosophical outlooks, is there really a way to get people to a place that they will make informed decisions for the betterment of the whole? Or as I see, you know, one of the, the challenges I see on a, a public policy basis these days, we're so frustrated at the macro level, that people just want to throw the whole darn thing out and start from scratch. And can <laughs> we ever get people together to agree on common facts and common principles? And is there enough elasticity in the system that people are willing to give and to take if it means I can make a step forward. It may not be the perfect step forward, but I can take a step forward and find some incremental way to make improvement. So California is a great place. You know, I've, I've done a huge amount of work on the issues on California water, as you know. Um, it's a very diverse place hydrologically and politically and economically and by every measure. Um, it's a difficult place for water because of a lot of those challenges, because of the climate, because of the diversity, because of the size, uh, because of the historical story, the historical conditions and stories that, that we have to deal with. Um, but I also believe that a lot of the success stories that I think are gonna help lead us to a more, a, a more positive future come out of the work that's being done in California, that's been done in California. Um, I, you know, I do think we'll always continue to fight about California, but we're also, <laughs> if you look back over time, we're making a lot of progress. I, I it, it seems slow because it is slow. It's not as fast as, <laughs> as I'd like it to be. It's not as fast as it ought to be. It's not as fast as it could be. And because of that, bad things continue to happen. But I do believe if you look back over time, and maybe this is one of the only advantages, Charlie, of getting old, <laughs> is, is that you get a little perspective. Things have changed. You know, so for example, um, I would never 10 years ago have hoped that we could get groundwater legislation. You know, California was one of the last places in the world, frankly, that had no groundwater law. And the bad things associated with our groundwater use are legion. They're, they're, we, we could go into them. We could you could have a whole you could have a whole conversation about that. There's there's a whole other book coming, Peter. I can feel it. <laughs> but um, the severe drought from 2012 to 2016, uh, one of a series of severe droughts, led to some political openings that permitted us to pass in, in Sacramento the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and. I don't think anybody believes that Sigma is perfect. 
I don't think anybody believes that it's happening fast enough. I don't think anybody believes it'll necessarily solve all of our water, groundwater problems, but it's absolutely a great step forward. Uh, and it's one that I would not have predicted was possible, but ultimately the stars aligned and it was partly a crisis and it was partly politics and it was partly compromise on the part of all of the parties. Um, but it was a step, it was a step forward. Uh, I would also argue that when we started our work at the Pacific Institute on water efficiency a, a long time ago, water efficiency was not viewed as a major water policy. It was find more supply, which was the traditional water right. policy everywhere. The assumption is population is growing, our demand is growing, our, our, our economy is growing, we're going to need more water. But the work that we did at the Institute, first highlighting the potential for cost-effective, smart conservation and efficiency, and then a whole series of very innovative community programs, a lot of them in Southern California. You know, the, the Mothers of East LA project that gave away free toilets, um, efficient toilets that helped reduce demand for water out of the, the Mono Lake Basin. You know, there's a lot of great stories that showed that efficiency was an incredibly powerful thing. And today, California uses a lot less water totally and a lot less water per person than we did 30 years ago. And the idea that we had to build our way out of it and find more supply and build another pipeline from heaven knows <laughs> the Mississippi River, those conversations have changed. Uh, and that's part of the, the thing that gives me hope that, that this, these changes over time, the, the way new thinking slowly becomes modern thinking and the the main thinking is uh, i think it's a great thing well peter i'm you know we know the book's out you're going to be a new york times best-selling author here very soon <laughs> so we're not going to worry about the book so i gotta then ask now that you've put this project to this you know out out for the public to consume and they'll they'll accept it what other things are you working on what other kind of projects what's hot on your plate these days what are you looking forward to well, at the at the biggest scale, my interest is making sure that we move forward on this positive path that I think is possible but not inevitable, that we figure out a way to make it inevitable. And part of that is educating multiple audiences, policymakers, communities, economists, academics, uh, uh, farmers, about the way that we can move toward a future where we're using water more carefully and efficiently and sustainably. We're restoring ecosystems. We're growing more food with less water. Uh, we're meeting basic human needs for everyone on the planet. We're restoring ecosystems. That, that's the vision. And that's the message that I want to continue to carry forward. You know, I'm still doing a lot of work on water and conflict and figuring out ways to reduce conflicts over water worldwide. Um, but the, the big... I guess the big message is we have this opportunity. Let's not squander it. Well, I think it's a great message. And I have very much enjoyed our conversation today. Dr. Peter Glick, thank you for being with us. And uh, I know you're a fan. Maggie's in the other room and she's no longer splashing around in the water bowl, but she still manages to find her way into some of our TikTok videos at the Water Coalition. She, <laughs> she becomes a, everybody still loves to see a dog when they, when they're seeing their social media feeds. Well, Charlie, so, I, I've, I've really appreciated the conversation. It's a, it's a, it's fun been talking to you about these issues, and it's great to talk to somebody who's as familiar with water as as anybody else. And uh, I look forward to future conversations. Dr. Peter Glick, Pacific Institute. Thank you so much for being with us. Stay with us for a second. We'll be back with some closing thoughts. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining us on What Matters Water TV and Podcast. If you like today's discussion, go to wherever you download your podcast and give us that five-star rating. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to our channel. That'll help us build our presence in this new world and on this new format. And if you're interested in helping sponsor this program, please reach out to us on the SoCalWater.org and send us a message. And as we close today's show, I leave you with this challenge. Be a part of the conversation. Be a part of the solution. At the Southern California Water Coalition, we educate to advocate. So as public policy leaders have difficult choices, together we help them make informed decisions. Thanks for being with us, and we'll see you again next time on What Matters Water TV and Podcast.